Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today it's my pleasure to welcome my friend Jay Hairston. He's a content creator in the esports space. He's a host, and for a time he was the voice of the Dallas Fuels social media. He has a ton to share on his career path and a lot of deep insights on social media and esports. Let's talk to Jay. Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC DLC Drop Drop Podcast. Podcast. All right, Jay Hairston, thank you so much for joining me today on the DLC Drop Podcast. Thanks so much for having me, man. I appreciate the invite. My pleasure. We have interacted many times. On stage and off stage. On stage, off stage. In bars and out of bars. A little bit everywhere. Yeah, Yeah. we've we've shared some stages at the esports stadium in Arlington. Yep. Um, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yep, of all places. Of all places, <laughs> we've uh, we've worked on some projects together, and I've just been a fan of what you've done. Um, Likewise, you, man. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. I've I, I've been very close to the folks at, at Envy, the Dallas right. Fuel, the Empire, because we all live here in Dallas. Mm-hmm. And one thing I I really remember, which I think it just really blew me away. We we're in Minneapolis for the first Call of Duty League. Yep. Uh, major. And I was sitting next to you, and you're like doing your thing. You're taking pictures. Fingers flying, man. Fingers flying. I had no idea you're hitting send on the Empire account, you know, but you're like interacting with me, being super cool and cordial. And then you're also the voice of what would be the champions. The, the future champions. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and then and it, I was further blown away that when I brought you in for a project that we worked on together, I was like, they're like, we need somebody to do social a social media plan. I was like, I think I know somebody. So I hit you up. I had no idea you were as good as you are <laughs> at that. And so I was like, you know, you're creating stuff. I was learn. I was like taking notes, Heck you know, yeah. and just super hyped, excited to share those insights and your career journey with our audience. For Thanks sure, man. Here. It's so funny that you mentioned the, the Call of Duty opening weekend, because anytime you go to those events, you can almost tell who the social media people people are because they look like the most disinterested people <laughs> in the room. Everybody else is cheering and yelling and watching the screens. And, and this person is nose down in their phone, just fingers flying. And that's that's really what the job entails. And yeah, we'll probably get into that a little bit today. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So tell us, give us a little bit more of an intro who are you? And then let's uh, let's walk down this career journey of yours about how this all started. A, a walk down memory lane, if you will. Yes. Uh, my name is Jay Harrison. I am a um, host, content creator, community manager, um, social media manager. I've pretty much done everything in the space of digital marketing. Um, I've worked with some of the you know the biggest brands of entertainment. I've worked with Bandai Namco, uh, Funimation. If you're an anime head like I am. Uh, and then esports as well, uh, right here in Dallas with the Dallas Fuel, Dallas Empire, uh, Team Envy, some of the you know the, the biggest names in the biz. So I've been very blessed to um, you know work in in this space that I love. Uh, video games have always been my thing, but uh, I never thought I would be here. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was it, it was a it was a long kind of roundabout journey, and I hope you know by the end of this podcast you can you know, take a little snippet of information away from me and save yourself, a, you know, a lot of time and, and heartache, uh, hopefully. So, yeah, that's my goal today. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing I want to share, we'll get into this a little bit later, is, you know, how to get into this industry. Sure. Um, but first, uh, walk me through your starting point. So you've always been a gamer. From always been a gamer. First love. I think I never thought that you could even have a career. So it wasn't even on my radar. That was my question. Yeah. yeah. As a kid, um, uh, I grew up in a basketball family. So basketball was life. You know, I went to, you know, three practices a night. I had school, I had city league, and then I had, you know, private t- traveling team that my dad coached. Wow. Um, so, you know, it was just, my mom used to get so mad. We wouldn't get home till like 10 o'clock at night and eating mm-hmm. dinner at 10 o'clock homework and, and, you know, uh, rinse and repeat the next day. Uh, so everybody just knew, um, you know, when I when I really shined in high school, I, I won pretty much every award there is to win in Cheyenne, Wyoming, which is my hometown. Congratulations. I had no idea. Yeah. I've I, driven I mean, through Wyoming. <laughs> yeah, that most people have. <laughs> <laughs> most, it's not, uh, it, they say it's a great place to leave. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, basketball in Wyoming is not, I guess, um, necessarily, um, you know, what we're known for. And so when I started getting a lot of... Uh, 
uh, scholarship opportunities for college, they weren't from the schools that I was really hoping for. Mm. You know, everybody was just knew I was going straight to a Duke in North Carolina and then straight to the NBA and just, you know, riding off into the sunset, you know, and, and living the basketball dream. Um, but that didn't happen. I got I got a lot of offers, uh, good offers um, from a lot of ugly states. So your your Utahs, your North Dakotas. No offense, Utah, and North no, Carolina. Yeah, n- n- no offense to anyone from there. <laughs> I think you're beautiful. Uh, yeah, if you're outdoorsy, <laughs> that's the place to be. Um, which is probably why I'm so techy now. Is is growing up in Wyoming. It's you hunt, you camp, you fish, you play sports. That's pretty yep. much all there is to do. Um, so that's why I'm such a nerd now. Um, what position did you play? Point guard. As a as a six foot point guard uh in high yeah. school yeah so uh, not too shabby it's funny uh my center um from high school is a, is a dude named james johnson he currently plays for the new jersey nets wow um he's actually getting a lot of time too uh this dude was six five half black half samoan so if you can imagine me throwing alley-oops off the backboard in high school <laughs> yes. uh, to this guy uh you know we, we we definitely put on a show um, so he ended up going to Wake Forest because he was huge enormous, and I was kind of lost. Is like if I'm not a basketball player, wow. who am I? And so I kind of um, waited around. I hit it. I hit some junior colleges and played some ball for a little bit um, mm-hmm. and before deciding to go to art school of all places in Las Vegas. I had a buddy out there, and I was like, mm. I mean, I could do worse than going to Las Vegas, you know. True. And, and uh, uh, so I, I headed out there, and uh, luckily the special needs work that I've done found me there it really started there i was um playing world of warcraft heavily pretty much depressed um mm-hmm. you know so i was playing like 10 hours a day <laughs> and yeah. uh, my girlfriend at the time she was back in colorado and she said oh my god she played as well she said my my guild mate lives in las vegas you need to meet up with him hmm. um ended up being this cool guy from dallas uh named michael thomas who um currently is the he- executive director at my possibilities uh school for uh, uh, uh special needs up in plano Cool. So he currently runs that. Uh, but at the time, he was living in Vegas, and he introduced me to the world of special needs. I started volunteering with the Muscular Dystrophy Association. I got my first taste of events. He would put on mm-hmm. the Santa Run every year in Las Vegas. If you can imagine Fremont Street and 5,000 uh, runners in Santa suits, um, we, you know, we orchestrated that. So um, it was just a really cool place to be. I love um, you know, the, the people that I worked with. Uh, individuals with uh, disabilities tend to be the most humble, genuine, mm. honest people yeah. you know, that you can ever meet. Um, which is rare these days. So, you know, I, I took a liking to it right away. Um, did that for five years out in Vegas. Um, I was making minimum wage. I had a cricket phone. I was, <laughs> I was, I was literally waking up at four in the morning to catch the bus at five to go across town. It was like a suburb of, of, um, of Las Vegas. So I had to ride the bus into Las Vegas. It took me probably like two or three hours. So I was, I would do all that just to be late to work by 30 minutes, but I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't fire you. They didn't fire me because I was, right. I was good. I, I came in smiling. Um, you know, they made me feel like a rock star and I tried to do that in return. It was mm. high fives. Every time you come down the hallway, it's like, Mr. Justin, high five, high five. Even though I'd seen them seven times already that day, they were, yeah. you know, they were all about it. So it, it, it made me feel good and it made me feel good to be assisting them, you know, so it was, it was kind of a mutual exchange. Uh, so I wasn't living the dream, but I was happy, man. I, I, I really thought I would, um, you know, do that forever. Um, you know, fast forward a couple of years, uh, Michael Thomas, the, you know, the dude I work with, he ended up coming back to Dallas and getting involved with my possibilities in Plano. So come on out, man. I got a, I got a job for you, nice. uh, you know, running the afternoon program. I eventually kind of worked my way up to management where I was overseeing about 30 uh, staff members. Wow. Um, if you can imagine like a college or a, a high school uh, where students are rotating different classes and we're not talking about academia, we're talking um independent living skills, vocational mm-hmm. training, uh, culinary arts, health and wellness, you know, things like that, that are going to make them, you know, productive members of society and kind of get them back into the community. That's, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. Um, so I was working with retired special ed teachers, um, therapists, um, you know, counselors, music therapists, oh, you name it. So that was my day to day is kind of, you know, going through the halls and serving as quote unquote principal of the yeah. school and just kind of managing things. Uh, you know, making sure everyone was safe and and, and, and learning. Thought I was going to do it forever. Um, at the same time, I was attending E3 because that gaming still runs deep. Right. No, but it was it was a lot of fun, man. I I, I headed to the Nintendo booth. They always did it right. Um, and there was this older gentleman. It was the year Mario Maker came out. I don't know if you're familiar with that game. 
Um, but he was up there reading a cue card and just butchering it, man. He like mm. didn't care at all about the games, didn't want to be there. It was clear they just kind of like hired this guy to, you know, read this thing. And I was yeah. like, man, like I could do this. And then that kind of epiphany moment happened. And I was like, wait, I could do this. And so I, I could really do this. Yeah, I immediately, actually. I immediately switched gears, um, you know, started uh, looking for public speaking classes, you know, anything mm. that could like help me speak more articulately, uh, much better than I would in this podcast. <laughs> um, but no, I, quick I question on that. Yeah, so because most people are afraid of public speaking more than death itself. I yeah. Mean, in fact, when I have a good friend, Greg Witt, who we both know, and uh, he does a lot of public speaking. I do a little public speaking. One of the things we're talking about as far as the opportunities there is the reason why you can make a lot of money doing public speaking, which I haven't done yet, for the record. <laughs> Working on it. Give me a call. Um, is so few people, you have all these filters. Mm-hmm. So you got like 99% of people are terrified of it. So that 1% who aren't scared, that doesn't mean they're good. Right. Right. That doesn't mean they're pursuing it. And that doesn't mean they have something to talk about that people want to hear about. So once you get into a vibrant category that's relevant, yep. pursuing it, and then you're good, it's like five people. Yep. So it's not, as, it's not <laughs> as big of a pool as you think. Yeah, for sure. So you clearly were not afraid of public speaking. Had you done public speaking or hosting before? Or did you just like... I want to get into gaming and I see an opportunity and I want to do this even though I haven't done it before. One of the things I, I always credit my dad for is he always made me, when we would fundraise for our basketball team as kids, he would make me walk into the business and like be the spokesperson. I had to lead. Wow. I couldn't mm-hmm. look at the floor. I had to make eye contact the whole time. Yeah. So I've always kind of been good speaking to people. Mm. Um, I guess the next level of that is crowds. And so yeah. I've done anywhere from you know 500 to 5,000. Um, which can be a little kind of nerve wracking, especially when you hear yourself. T- sometimes um, you can hear yourself on the on the feedback, think, and that yeah. plays with your head when you can hear yourself talk, but you have to be thinking about your next line. That comes with experience, right? That yeah. takes some time. Or baptism, like by fire, like I did. You know, just they throw you in there to save a buck, and and you either sink or swim. I think just being flexible and 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 being honest with yourself and saying, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna make the best of this. Yeah, you know, whatever it is. Um, but I will say there is a big difference between public speaking and speaking to a camera. And I'm not really sure why. It's something that I'm mm. still figuring out. Yeah. Because um, I would say I'm much more, I would much rather talk to a room of 5,000 people yeah. than a camera. If it's just me and, you know, a, a producer or something like that and a camera, like I need something to look at. I've almost wanted to like cut out a picture of like DJ Khaled's face <laughs> and put it around the camera just so I have somebody to look at. So it feels yeah. like more natural and like I'm talking to a person. Well, you have to, you're basically acting mm-hmm. in a way when you're talking to a camera. Yep. When you have a crowd, what I've found, so for me too, I'm curious your take on this. Are you more nervous if there's fewer people or more people? Intimate settings are kind of scary. Um, you you notice a little cough, or somebody you know adjusts their clothes, or if somebody yeah. stands up. Those are a lot more noticeable than when it's a you know the, the room's flooded and somebody walks out or you know is on their phone. You don't really Same. notice those things. So, yeah, yeah, the intimate settings are actually harder than the big crowds. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and what I've found, I've I've gotten this advice and I've done it and it's worked out well. Is you identify a few faces in the room who are really paying attention. Mm-hmm. And so as you're talking, you're talking to these people. You feed off their energy. Exactly. And so you're not just, you know, faceless crowd, listen to my insights or my hosting, whatever. It's like, I see you engaged, so I'm going to talk to you, and then I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to talk to you. And not only does it help you, because it's, I I think it makes it more intimate, more one-to-one. For sure. But also when you identify a few people around the room, then you're not ignoring this section of the room because if I'm just here and there's a hundred other people exactly you get three or four people that you just kind of bounce to and then it that's what I always have to remember is is keeping you know this what is it not breaking the fourth wall or whatever no that that fifth wall I don't know I don't know theater I was in theater but I don't remember the term but basically opening yourself up to the crowd is is essentially what it is I think it's the fourth wall it's like Deadpool yeah the Deadpool movie yeah he breaks the fourth wall in the comics as well right he talks to the reader Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you 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 try to make it casual. You try to keep yourself, um, you know, facing. Sometimes I have the bad habit when I'm interviewing people. I you know turn and they're in the whole crowd's just staring at the side of my face the whole time. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's you know it's little things like that you pick up along the way. I think the the best thing you can do is 
you know, be your own worst critic and go back and review the tape. Yes. Anytime you can get somebody to record it, even if it's like a, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, something like that, um, to record you when you're on stage or whenever you have a, you know, a, pub, a public speaking um, obligation, watch that back and, and, and critique yourself and say, and, and also look at um, other speakers that you admire. Yeah. Um, Chris Puckett, uh, one of the kind of considered best hosts in all of esports. Yes. He was somebody I really looked up to early on coming in is, okay, how does he, how does he conduct himself? How does he present himself when he's on stage? Mm-hmm. You know, is he fun? Uh, the voice inflection, like little things that, you, you, you know, can, can make or break a performance. You know, those are the things that I really look to. And then also um, the best advice I ever got was, you know, the people watching the video or, on, or, or in the crowd are going to match your energy. So if your energy is low yeah. and you come out and it's like, hey, guys, make some noise for me. Yeah. You know, crowd's going to be, uh, what's going on? Yeah, skip this guy. I'm on my phone until somebody, you know, with some energy comes. Yeah. Um, so no that's one, something I always try to bring to the table. Yeah, no one's going to be more hyped than you are. They shouldn't be. Right. Yeah. Like, if you come out and you're mid-level mm-hmm. or what have you, no one's going to be like, I'm so hyped. I don't know why <laughs> he's not excited, but I am. Right. But if you're here, no one's going to be above that. Most people will be below mm-hmm. that, right? So yep. you also don't want to be like a weirdo doing somersaults and stuff. There, the, There is a line between high energy and, and cringeworthy. Yeah. Um, and you just have to kind of know that balance. You have to, the majority of the crowd is going to match your energy. And then you have the, the little section on the side. I know you remember it was the GameStop section where the dudes had, I'm talking for the Overwatch League when they came to Dallas. Yes. And we had 5,000 screaming fans. There was the little set GameStop section where it was like um, face paints and dudes didn't have shirts on. And they yep. had fuel written across their chest and waving the flags. You have to be at least at their energy level uh, because, you know, they're there to have a good time as well. And they'll help you out and they'll play off you and you play off them. So, But consider wearing a shirt. Consider wearing a shirt. Yeah. So what I'm getting from this is that you, so you saw an opportunity, but then you took some classes. That's really interesting to me that you said, let me make sure that I'm getting prepared, Mm -hmm. like in a very, from an educational perspective. Uh, Was that your automatic thought or did somebody give you that advice? Um, No, that was my, that was my first thought. I think that just speaks to the education, um, that I received growing up, Wyoming's, we may suck at everything else, but education, <laughs> we're usually up in that like top 10, you know, for, for schools. Um, so, you know, I just knew it was just like sports. I guess it was, I guess sports as well. Um, just knowing you have to prepare for a game, just like if you're going on stage, you can't just be really eager and love esports and love gaming sure. and just jump up there or you will get, uh, yeah, you will get a, a rude awakening. So I definitely wanted to do my homework. Uh-huh. Um, and basically try to, um, one of my favorite Bruce Lee quotes is absorb what is useful, discard what is useless. So mm. when I talked about the guys like Puckett and um, Golden Boy and other like famous esports speakers, mm-hmm. I would watch them and take the little things that I liked from them um, and try to either put my spin on it or make it my own. And so, yeah. you know, take that little, that, that little bit of their arsenal and, you know, add it to my toolbox. So that's something that I see. I get blown up all day by people in my, in my DMs like, how, you know, how do I get into esports? How do I... Yeah. You know, wh- what do I do? I'm I'm so ready, and it's it's so great to be eager and you know dream big and you know all those things. But th- that's just not enough at the end of the day. Like you have mm. to prepare yourself. Nobody is going to make a job for you, and nobody yeah. wants somebody who's just eager that's not you know skilled or um, experienced. I think is the biggest thing. Well, and I I think that's one of the the biggest struggles with our industry is the experience aspect. Yep. And so I'm the chairman of the Esports Trade Association. Our goal there is to help improve the business practices of the esports industry. And you have this unique dynamic in esports, traditional industries, traditional sports. You have people who've done it 20, 30 years who totally get it. They've marketed to themselves forever. The the consumer is used to being marketed to. So, you know, when we go to a basketball game or we go to a Dallas Cowboys game, I use this example all the time. There's a little Albertsons blimp that flies around. Mm -hmm. And us as football fans, we're like, cool. Little blimp, Albertsons. Maybe I'll go grocery shopping there sometime, right? Yeah. Now, if we as football fans had the same mindset as esports fans, we would say, what the hell is Albertsons <laughs> doing here? They don't have anything to do with football. Right. right. Right? Right. Unless 
they were to enhance the experiences of the community and things of that nature. It's got to be a drone instead of a blimp. There's got to be like a flamethrower or something on it. You know, yeah, you have to get, you have to definitely know your audience and, and, and cater to them and, and approach them in a way that they want to be spoken to um, that I guess doesn't feel watered down or, or, or basic as hell. I think you yeah. said it. It's like we've been marketed to the same way for so long. Mm-hmm. Only the brands that are, you know, innovating and, and, you know, trying different things are the ones that are really thriving right now. Well, I, I think a big part of it is simply every time I talk to a brand, I say if the experiences of the community are not better as a result of your brand being part of it, you're not ready to do it yet. Mm-hmm. In traditional sports, it's just like, hey, we got all these sponsorable assets. It's an awareness play, or it's a sampling play, or, or, or something like that, right? And it's like, okay, on the side of the uh, basketball, uh, you know, they've got that LED on yeah. the side of the, the basketball post there. Is It's like, is that going to say State Farm? Is that going to say Geico? Is that going to say what have you, right? Yeah. If you just do that in esports, you would wish you never entered the space at all. Correct. But my point would be, Okay, people are going to an event like the Dallas Fuel Homestand, like we're talking about. Well, you talk about so actually, GameStop was a sponsor there, and I was leading that activation. Some of the things that we did there, one was it was very simple. Uh, what we did was we had a booth out where all the brands had booth activations. Mm-hmm. So I was talking to our good friend Shea Butler, and he's like, "John, here's the diagram. Where do you want to be?" I was like, "Put me next to Frostbite Cosplay." Smart, because everybody. Man is going to be want to be next to heck yeah i mean the the reinhardt and these other characters that they've built they're insane and so when they started setting it up this was just like divine timing it was like you couldn't make this up but it worked perfectly basically their reinhardt came in and it's a huge dude looks like a tank amazing a man tank yeah exactly it even had like steam coming out of the back like the what what they do is incredible yep I said, hey, man, can I get a photo of you in our booth with all this GameStop branding behind you? He's like, yeah, for sure. Well, he comes over, immediately a line form. (laughs) And so rather than being in their own booth, they were in our booth. Because they didn't have like a backdrop or anything, right? They were just there. It was like, hey, take a picture. Exactly. And so then and we did that for a full day. The next day, they just automatically came back to our booth because they were like, that was awesome. Yeah. And so what we did there... That's enhancing. Right. So we gave people an Instagrammable moment, mm-hmm. right? We gave them something... Like, I have a picture and I share it all the time. Like, I'm leaning next to Reinhardt and I'm like, I'm still hyped on that photo. That was like four years ago. <laughs> and But what we did was take a photo, post it on Twitter, tag the Dallas Fuel, Corsair, partner of yep. the Fuel, and hashtag OWL Ultimate Fan. You are then entered into a contest to win either a, a Corsair headset mm-hmm. or a behind the tour, behind the scenes tour with Hastro. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And then we had the we had the special section like you talked about, and then we also did the after party, and so that gave people the opportunity to to meet and greet and mix. I remember meeting Pocket there for the first yep. time. I remember Scump came out. I was like, if we got Scump <laughs> to come to an Envy event, like that's a win. And that's experience marketing, man. That, that's what it's all about. And I th- and I love that you took it not only in person, but also put it online. Yeah. Um, because that's the next step is you want to create that fear of FOMO. So people are like, damn, like, look at all these like awesome, you know, you know, activations that were there. I'm going to go next time. And that's yeah. what it's all about and vice versa. Well, and it worked. We um, I have this stat not in my head, but I have it online and I'll post this around the release of this episode. But we had, I want to say, almost double but by far more engagements than Overwatch League, Bud Light, <laughs> any other brand that was associated with that event, we were far and away above. And it wasn't it wasn't difficult. It was simple. Yep. But what it did was it said, let's understand what the consumer wants and let's let our brand organically give it to them. Exactly. And the other thing was like to do that, that made sense for GameStop's brand. Like if you if it was like Frito Lay if Frito was Lay was like yeah we've got a booth with uh, Reinhardt whatever like that might not make sense mm-hmm. it's like no you need another way to enhance experiences that's consistent with your brand story exactly and I think the litmus test is kind of you look at something and you just say yeah that makes sense like you 
You're doing that. Yeah. If you kind of have that raised right. eyebrow, then you know, like, eh, if you yeah. if you do any of that, if, if there's any hesitation, like esports, yeah, we'll we'll throw you out. They'll basically kick you out of the club. <laughs> yeah. And something I want to get into, we're we're jumping ahead a little bit here, but is you know, okay, so you went to Funimation, you're the the voice of the Dallas Fuel, and that's what I want to get into a little bit here is. So I have a pretty good understanding of how to run an activation or a campaign, like an event. We talked about the hashtag, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But when you get onto the social media aspect of that, this is what I was so impressed by when we worked on that project together, is you had just such a great understanding of how to not just engage the audience, but how to do it regularly over time with a brand voice Mm -hmm. that was consistent in a way that was interesting, that spoke to them in the language they want to be spoken to. How do you do that? <laughs> Man, it's a, that is a, you have to have a strong team, especially in esports. When it comes to esports social media, I think it can be ruthless. When you think about the role it plays, um, mm-hmm. just in kind of the, the ecosystem. What is that role? Esports is all about eyeballs. That's what makes the money. It's sponsorship dollars, you get yep. the eyeballs. That connects directly to everything that's coming out of content and social media because mm. that's like the first touch point, um, you know, for most brands. And so, and and not only that, most of those um, teams tend to be understaffed. They they tend to put the the least resources in the most important um, department, and that could just be me be talking, you know, bias about this. But like my um, team should have most. I, most I of the help, well, it's, usually it's interns, it's social coordinators. That's kind of the the entry level role. Um, And what essentially they are is they take content that's been created and you're putting it together and you're coming up with some decent copy. um, So what the post will say, what the tweet will say Mm -hmm. um, and making it relevant to the audience. So when I say it's a team effort, you have someone like uh, me who may be at the, you know, the head of the table. Um, I hate titles, by the way, like I never pull rank. But as a social media manager, Mm -hmm. if a decision needs to be made, you know, you hold that, what is it, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. You're that guy. So if it, yeah. if it flops, then everybody's looking at you. They're not looking at the social coordinator. Um, so then you need almost, you, you need kind of your, your kind of technical, I call them like secretary brains, where you're just good at organizing stuff. You're great with calendars mm-hmm. and spreadsheets. And you can say, okay, this post slots in here over this month. You know, this month's kind of thin, so we need to put a post here. These are the optimal times to post. You know, there's so much like behind the scenes data that goes into scheduling a post and, and having an yeah. editorial calendar. And then you need a super fan. You need somebody who lives, mm-hmm. breathes, and, 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 you know, dies by that brand, that game, you know, whatever it is, that league. Um, they're going to be the ones that are going to tell you, they're going to have that sniff test and say, okay, mm-hmm. this is cringe or, you know, this is this speaks to the audience because it's speaking to them directly. Is that so, super fan internal on your team or is that somebody who you, you could find externally and you just have a relationship there? I've seen it done a bunch of ways. Generally, you want them in-house so you can, yeah. you know, it, you have them on text, you have them on Slack, Discord, whatever you need, and you can, you know, back and forth. Uh, but I've definitely done it with community moderators. Mm-hmm. So... When you, you spoke on uh, my time with Funimation. Funimation has over, God, 400 different animes that they have um, that they license and distribute in the States. They're the, you know, the biggest um, and baddest in the U.S. And all of those brands need to be marketed. So there's no way a team of you know four or five individuals is going to be able to know everything about these shows that go thousands of episodes and you know hundreds of seasons or what have you so you can really lean on community moderators and that's something that i kind of took advantage of is they're the experts they know the brand we tie the business to it and they tell you straight Mm -hmm. up like this is too much you know this is overbearing this looks super salesy super ad ad adsy super corny um, you need you need someone to keep it real with you, and you yeah. go okay back to the drawing board. Let's let's adjust that copy. Um, but not only that, my first role at Funimation was community manager, and basically all your job was to do was listen to the community and tell the higher ups what they want. Yeah. So when it came to a DVD release or merch or you know anything like that, here here's the bullet point of you know nine or ten things that I'm consistently seeing that the community is asking for. Can we give it to them? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, Mm no. On those no times, you have to have the skills to, I guess, navigate those waters and, you know, handle it in a a tactful manner. And that's where my special needs background came into play, the, you Mm. know, the patience and understanding and, you know, communication that you have to have in that field. 
it, it was like a weird crossover set of skills for working in community management on the social media side yeah. um, because my day in special needs could be, you know, somebody getting hit or bit and basically they were trying to communicate that they were hungry. Mm. On the anime side, it was you guys didn't include the special effects uh, extras in the DVD release of my favorite anime. I'm going to blow up your studio. And we got <laughs> messages. <laughs> we got messages like that. And it's like, OK, I am the frontline defender. It's my job to, um, you know, take threats credibly, but also try to talk this person off the ledge like, hey, mm. we hear you. We understand. What would you what would you like? OK, if we can't do that. You know, here's some alternatives. You know, here's yeah. some things. Let me send you a box of merch. Everybody loves merch. That was kind of my go-to. If I we if, do. It, if we just hit one of those, like, you know, one of those no return places where you know people were just extremely upset with the brand, like, hey man, shoot me your address. And they're like, what? I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna you know send you out a box of stuff. I really understand that you were upset that we didn't include this. You know, the subtitles in the in the DVD release. Yeah. So and I and I hear you and I understand you and so you know I can't do anything about it, but at least I can hopefully make your day with some free merch. And nine yeah. times out of 10, you know, happy, you walk away happy customer. So what I'm hearing is that if I want free merch, I should make <laughs> uh, threats, threat. you know, threats straight to Twitter DMs. Uh, it's probably the best route. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Writing that down. Uh, what I heard from you, which I think is, I mean, I think it's true across the board. It's true in relationships. It's true in business is you said, I hear you. Right. And one of the things that's unique about, I would say, Gen Z in general, but gamers, esports enthusiasts, this social media demographic, right. is they are skeptical and they will go go after you. Have you identified? Are you talking why cancel culture? Like the, the cancel culture? Yeah, I don't know if I would say cancel. Well, like brands getting canceled, right? Mm -hmm. Or or getting. Um, blacklisted if you will i've i've heard panels where you know these non-endemic brands are like this group of people is so toxic like why is it worth me even trying because if i make one misstep if, even if i do it the right way for a long time yeah i make one misstep boom pounce i'm trending for all the wrong reasons yeah right and have you identified why that is oh man or do you have any something the fun uh, anime community was so much easier to work with in my experience than than gaming mm. and esports. When I would respond as a as the brand on Funimation side, mm -hmm. I was, oh my god, Funimation responded to my tweet. This is amazing. They're screenshotting yeah. it. They're retweeting it. They're showing all their friends. Uh -huh. You know, I would post something on the Dallas Fuel, and if our team wasn't winning, your team sucks. Like, <laughs> why are you posting this meme? Like, we don't want to see anything funny. We don't have want to have anything nice until the team starts winning. And it was it was brutal, man. Um, but when it comes to the brand specifically, uh, I, esports is just very unforgiving, man. Like, I, I tell people all the time, like even the spelling of esports, something as simple yeah. as the spelling of esports. E yes, if you put E dash capital S sports, uh, or the lower KC. you they immediately know that you're not one of them, I guess. Right, is, is what I would say. It's 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 clear that you're there for all the wrong reasons. If you can't understand kind of where they come from you have to know your audience it's it's so important you know so i i think it's just not knowing the audience and you're right it could be one slip up one time you know one yeah. bad promotion one bad idea depending on you know how bad it actually is it could stick with your brand for a, a very long time yeah you know I, I have a theory on why and i think my opinion i don't know if this is like the whole truth but i think it's at least part of it is this is a group of people who have not always been validated, who have been hated on. Yep. And now that gaming is becoming popular, we like I have a six-year-old son. I don't know if he will ever experience getting hated on for being a gamer mm -hmm. because it's so popular because everybody's a gamer, right? Is that so, weird? Especially as from a skater, coming from a skater. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. In fact, the skateboard, this is what I always say about skateboarding versus gaming. The difference is a desire to go mainstream. Hmm. So um, a lot of people know my skateboarding background. I got sponsored when I was 14. I used to skateboard for a living. Not a glamorous living, but a living nonetheless. I still skate to this day. But um, a lot of my understanding of the esports community, this skeptical community, especially with non-endemic outside brands, 
is from coming from a more extreme community as a skateboarder. And the reason, this is the great thing about esports and, and gaming in general, is if you validate these folks in meaningful ways, in ways that matter f- for them, you will not have a better group that will champion you more. They will be a ride or dies. Ride or die. Now, obviously, we've talked a little bit about if you do it wrong, it's the other side of the coin. Didn't Hex have people wearing like turtle wax gear for a while? Like turtle wax, like the car company or something yeah, like that. That is my favorite non endemic <laughs> brand. Uh, activation. Why are esports kids repping turtle wax? Because they're heroes who drive Porsches and G wagons and motorcycles. Exactly. Are cleaning their cars in the city. Like when I had a Honda Civic when I was 16. <laughs> nice. That was my Porsche. You know, like I <laughs> felt like when I was scrubbing that thing, like. I have a Lexus now, and I think I took better care of that Civic yeah. than I do my current car. But you got to believe that you know these content creators, these influencers, when they are, you know, Hex has a has a great Dane named Henry. I want to say I think he's got like over eight thousand followers on Instagram. Jeez, <laughs> yeah, this dog is beating me on uh, <laughs> social media metrics. But you got a you got a great Dane in the G wagon. You're gonna have to clean that thing up now and then, right? So number one, it, it made sense with the brand. It was organic, right? Yep. And then you have this guy who's, yeah, he has a nice car. He's got a big dog. Of course he has to clean his car. What's he cleaning it with? Everybody watches him. They've also got cars, right? And so you got to believe when they're going to AutoZone or o- O'Reilly's Auto Parts or whatever it is, whoever's sponsoring this episode, we'll find <laughs> <out>. <laughs> um, that they're going to pick up turtle wax, right? And so going back to the skateboarding and, and gaming example here is skaters do not want to go mainstream. Mm -hmm. Gamers do want to go mainstream. The perfect litmus test is the Olympics. So skateboarding was in the Olympics for the first time this year, Mm -hmm. and every core skateboarder could not be more bummed on it. (laughs) (laughs) Like, we're happy for the skaters who got to experience that. It's like, holy crap, you got to be in the Olympics. You're in a global stage. Yuto Horigami won the gold medal, like, I saw this that. dude won a gold medal in the Olympics for skateboarding. None of us ever thought would, that would happen. But you ask any skateboarder, should it be in the Olympics? It's a hard no. They'll say it's not a sport. It's a deeper conversation. They'll make a joke about the uniforms, which did look ridiculous. They're, they were pretty garbage. Yeah. yeah. But you go to anybody who's a fan of esports, and it's obviously a deeper conversation, which, which titles they should be playing. But you ask them, should esports be the Olympics? Yes, it is absolutely a sport. They need us more than we need them. We should be on this global stage, this, that, and the other. The difference, they want to be accepted by the mainstream. Hmm. Right? I think, um, yeah, I think times are changing. I know when I first got into esports, I felt the esports, I I separate gaming and esports. I think gaming is universal and esports is still kind of niche on the come up. And what I saw with esports sometimes is some of that gatekeeping and not wanting to go mainstream, but that was mm-hmm. early on in my career. And it felt like I described esports at, at the time, I described esports as, uh, you know, when you discovered a really cool indie band in high school and then everybody starts listening to them and it kind of pisses you off. Yeah. Cause it's like, that was, you know, that was my thing. Yeah. I saw that with esports coming up is, is it was, oh, now it's going to be, you know, a league and official and jerseys like you talked about and Uh stuff like that. And people still kind of wanted that down home, you know, grassroots, like, oh, these are the OGs and all these new kids are popping up and they don't really know what esports is about. Um, So it's good to see that times are changing. And I do think there is that group of, you know, the core that's like, we knew it before it was cool. You shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. But there's this sentiment of like, I wasn't picked to be on the basketball team, and I wish I was. Yep. But there's also a skepticism that comes from that. Like, remember that skeptical African kid meme? And he's looking at that lady like this. Yeah, yeah. That's the (laughs) esports community. And it's like, so now that you know I got millions of viewers, now you want to mess with me? That's so true. And so that's why there's a hesitancy. But when you enhance their experiences, when you give them what they want, but cannot attain for themselves, your brand is embraced. And this is the example I give well all, the, all the time in skateboarding. So Nike in skateboarding. Nike is two things in skateboarding. They are public enemy number one. They're also market share number one. Huh. Yeah. And they actually took three different times, three different attempts to get into skateboarding. And the first two were terrible failures. Because <laughs> all these skateboarders were like, nope, 
this is our zone. You're a bunch of jocks. We're counterculture. Right. We don't want to be validated. We don't want to get picked for basketball. We're in the streets skating these handrails, you know? And so the third time Nike came in, first what they did, they didn't sponsor the Tony Hawks or the Paul Rodriguez's or the Shane O'Neill's of the world. Now, P-Rod and Shane O'Neill are now on Nike. But what they did back then is they sponsored people who were beyond reproach in the eyes of the industry. People like Chet Childress, who you've probably never heard of. Never heard of him. And so what they would do is somebody would go to Chet Childress, the super like core pool skater, and would say, dude, you're messing with Nike? What's up with that? And he would say, man, you can hate if you want, but dude, these guys pay me to travel around the world, put me up in five-star hotels. I couldn't do this if it wasn't for them. Mm. And because he was beyond reproach, because they would give him the benefit of the doubt and be like, okay, I see that. So they built this strategy, but there was there one moment that really set them off in a positive way. And what it was, so skateboarding is all about street skateboarding. We're about skating what's not meant to be skated. So you see these plazas, like Love Park in Philadelphia was a big one. Just the way it's designed, it's been destroyed now and rebuilt so that you can't skate it, (laughs) (laughs) unfortunately. But it's one of those places that just looks like it's meant to be skated. The West LA Courthouse is one of those places. (laughs) So in all the videos in uh, in the 90s, it's in all these videos. It's It's got like a small stage and it's got all these ledges everywhere. Well, over time, you know, it became damaged by people grinding on the ledges. Sure. And it became illegal to skate there. What Nike did, they worked with the city of Los Angeles to legalize skateboarding at this skate spot and refurbish the whole thing. They put metal edges so, like, it doesn't get damaged and it's really easy. They repainted it now and then on June 21st, which is Go Skateboarding Day. Mm-hmm. Um, they do a big activation. But I imagine it was designed by skaters, too. They let them kind of, you know, take the lead in the, in, the, in the blueprints and everything. Well, No. No. So the the place itself, it, it's still naturally like what it was. They just put metal edges on there. Oh, okay, got you. Got so you. it just had to be, it was just a natural, perfect skate spot. And what they did was this was a place where skaters wanted to go. But think about this. So what, one thing that happens in skateboarding all the time is petitions to, to do a skate park. In fact, Garland is about, they're building a skate park right now. And nice. it's been years and years and years that they've been signing these petitions. But that's for a skate park. That's a legal place to go and do your thing. You could not have enough skateboarders in the world to sign petitions for LA to legalize a courthouse <laughs> to skate at. But guess who can? This big, greedy, big multi-billion biz. dollar bad guy. global company, the bad guy, used their evil for good. Huh. And so in the eyes of the skateboarding community, what they said was, you know what? I could hate on Nike for a lot of reasons, but I can't hate on that. All I got to do is give them respect. And then they built on that. But it, that is my guiding light. In esports, no matter what brand I'm consulting, what brand I'm approaching, I go with that mindset. What does the community want that they cannot attain for themselves? If you get credit for giving that to them, you're embraced. You're in the club. It's a brilliant approach. Yeah, absolutely. Period. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Period. Drop, drop, drop the mic that's attached to the stand. No, yeah, that's that's um. No, I think that's you. You were in the right state of mind as a, as as a marketer and as somebody who connects people, um, which is what I think you are the best at. Oh, is it. there's not many few people. There's not many people that can speak the language of the people and also the business. And True. Those interpreters that sit kind of in the middle. So valuable. I've been fortunate enough to be one of those people where I've had kind of the, the managerial training, but yeah. also been able to still, you know, chop it up with the gamers. So well, let's talk a little bit about that because I, I absolutely agree. I, I've worked in a, a number of different industries. I was in skateboarding. I worked in the, the animation graphic design industry for a while. Went to an agency, went to GameStop, PRG, do my own thing now. Um, and I remember I was at this design studio and it... I was not a designer. I'm not a designer. You've seen some of the decks I've created. It's pretty <laughs> obvious. <laughs> and so, but I had the mind of the client. And so sometimes our designers would be talking to a client and they wouldn't be able to get basic enough with somebody who was not a designer because... They're talking over their head. It's like speaking a different language. A hundred percent. Yeah. And so they would we would have issues with the production process because the client was not adequate adequately educated based on their level of understanding. 
but here I came. And I was like drinking from the wa- the fire hose, and it was like so stressful and crazy trying to learn this whole industry. I didn't know. But once I learned the production process, the terminology, etc., I was a great client facing account executive because I could talk to them in the way that they understood it. Mm-hmm. And then because of what I learned with the designers, I go back to them and I can talk to them in their language. Yep. And that's kind of what I've learned um, in esports as well. But share a little bit about how that value of being the translator between two groups of people who can't talk to each other. Sure. So one of my main responsibilities when I was working at Envy was to be that kind of brand liaison between, uh, you know, a Jack Link's beef jerky and our esports teams and understanding, you know, where they fit in best. Um, fortunately, brands are starting to understand they can't come in hot. They can't come in with just, OK, we, we want 50 posts and they all need to have, you know, product placement front and center and those kind of things. Yeah, um, they're, they're starting to understand that, you know, you almost want to be a backdrop to whatever you know, the consumer or the viewer already loves, you know, so if they love their, their esports athlete and their gaming, they want to see some, G, some Jack Link's beef jerky sitting on the table. They don't want to see you yeah. hold it up. Like it's the freaking eighties commercial. Mm, so tasty. And then take a bite and the, you know, that, that, you know, corny play. Right. Um, so when clients didn't understand that it was my job to say, Hey, it would probably play better if we, didn't start with that and took more of a mm-hmm. kind of a, a, a crawl walk run approach and in mm-hmm. the first phase a business side you know this is what you can expect this is the return you can expect yeah um and then that's going to lead you know to the next phase where now you know we can start doing you know discount codes or you know a, you know you know working guys into the jerseys or something like that whatever it may be um but you know taking it slow and, and basically holding their hand and guiding the brand <laughs> through this wonderful world we call esports um, yeah, it's not an easy thing to do, um, but the people who can do it, you know, hats off to you because um, I, I think of 100 Thieves. 100 Thieves does a really good job of incorporating their brands, not only in their content online, but in their, yeah. you know, battle, whatever they call it, their facility, uh, big black box out there in uh, California. Um, and having the different rooms, the and cash app and compound, the cash app compound, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a, like it's like no building I've ever seen. Um, you know, Dude, it works. I, were you at the esports awards? I wasn't. Okay. I didn't go this year. Okay, so I went and I did the golfing. I don't golf, so <laughs> everybody found that out. But Nade Shot was there. Yeah, and guess who he brought as one of his partners to play the the golf tournament? <sighs> I wish I knew golfers. Uh, cause um, I immediately thought Tiger Woods. Yeah. So Nade shot brought us open champion Bryson DeChambeau to join his team. And it was such a, that's nutty, a, a baller move and such a Nade shot move. It was like, like the reaction was like, of course he did. That's not even a weird flex. That's just a flex. Yeah. And it's like, of course he's your friend. And of course he's going to come all the way out. And then of course they won that tournament. Yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. If you don't win, then something's wrong. You got to step up your golf game, though. I hear, I hear, I don't know, but I hear so much business happens on the golf course as far as like actual that's business. True. So somebody, my stepdad I'm, plays I'm off my clubs. Yeah, no, I was at Top Golf last night. Yeah, and I'll. This is something that I've recognized because sometimes I'm at Top Golf, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. <laughs> Hit the ball a little further. I'm hitting it straight, but there is a big difference between hitting the same shot every time. And then being on a golf course. Exactly. And you got one chance at that drive. And you got one chance at that fairway or probably the rough if you're me. You got one chance at that chip, one chance at that putt. And it is way different and way harder. But there, there's an entire community happening around the golf gaming club in L.A. Really? Yeah, there's a, a guy named Hung Tran. And I don't know the name. He, he's, he used to be with Alt. He's with CSL now. Yeah. And he's just brought together with some other people this tremendous group and they were the ones who in coordination with esports awards brought this thing together and i thought it was so cool that it's like you have this networking opportunity this this is great community opportunity there's nothing to do with esports other than we all work in that industry but we all love doing this too and it's cool that's the thing for brands too is like it doesn't always have to be about gaming Mm -hmm. like we talked about turtle wax earlier right yeah that had nothing to do with gaming they're just gaming influencers who do other stuff too. What do they do? They drive nice cars. They need to clean them. Turtle wax. Bam. Count your money. 
right? <laughs> count your money. <laughs> but one thing I want to get into a little bit before we wrap up here is I want to share with the audience, how can somebody get into esports? Sure. And so a lot of people either, there's two sides, right? You've got the side that is young, up and coming, you're coming out of college, you're coming to high school, whatever. Yep. And then you also have some people who are, uh, they're professionals in business. They've been around for a while. So take that either either way that you'd like. Sure. Um, get your pen and paper out because I'm going to tell you the, the, the biggest cheat code to getting in esports right now. Let's you, hear it. You go to LinkedIn. You <laughs> find someone who already has the job that you want and you comb through their profile and you say, okay, these are the jobs he's worked at. These, This is the skill set they have. And then you build that. You literally can copy pasta you know, somebody else's career model. Obviously, mm. take it with a grain of salt. You know, you'll have to kind of pave your own way and, you know, some things might not be relevant, but it is such an untapped resource to see who these, you know, people making the decisions at these companies that are your dream jobs, they're already there and they're showing you, you know, that's a, their I history never about that and where before. they, that's what I've done, man. I, I do it every, you know, interview I've ever had in my life. I go to LinkedIn, I see who I'm talking to and I really try to take an interest. Um, so th that's probably the first thing I would say. Um, along with that, apply. There's so many people that are like, oh, I want to work at, you know, FaZe Clan so bad. I'm like, did you apply? No, I don't think I'd get it. Well, <laughs> You're definitely not going to get it. Your chance of getting it if you don't apply is, is zero. You know, if you, if you apply and have no skills, um, you know, or no experience, that might be zero, 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 zero point one percent. But, it, you know, that's better than zero. I'm going to add to that. Go ahead. So do also apply do not be intimidated by the job description correct the job description a human does not exist who can fulfill that job description and a lot of the jobs you'll get you learn how to do it while you're doing it exactly now you got to do a lot of work you're drinking from the fire hose you really got to like pour in the time and effort to to catch up quickly but this is actually something i've heard is one of the reasons for the disparity between women and men in the workplace is men are more likely to be like, I'll give it a shot. Mm -hmm. I know how to do half of that. Women, and this is like generally, are less likely to see something that uh, and to go for it. They're mm -hmm. more likely to say, oh, I'm not qualified. They're also less likely to ask for a raise, which I found interesting when I looked at the study. Yeah. Yeah. So you closed mouth doesn't get fed. You have to you have to apply and there has to be a job for you. I think I touched on it earlier, but mm. nobody is going to create a job for you. It's great to be eager and all that, but nobody, you're not going to walk in and they're like, man, this guy, you know, he, he's just full of energy. Let's, let's make a place for him. You have to go to their websites. You have to go to, you know, the job fairs. You have to go um, on LinkedIn, um, hitmarkerjobs.net, um, yes. I believe it is, is a great resource, you know, for finding um, jobs within the gaming and esports space. But you have to look at the jobs you have to apply. And don't, like you said, don't be intimidated if you see, you know, three years experience, five years experience, throw down an app anyway, <laughs> you know, just, you know, take a wide approach, you know, shotgun approach and just blanket that, you know, every single job that you could potentially want to work for. And, you know, one of them's going to stick or you keep, you know, knocking down doors. Um, it's all about connections. So not only, yes. you, you know applying on their site, but actually going to their events, mm -hmm. not being, you know, the guy who's walking up and trying to have a full on conversation, you know, when, you know, staff are trying to do their job at an event or something <laughs> like that. That happens a lot to me where people want to shoot the breeze and I have, you know, an earpiece in and I'm, you know, getting cues from my producer and I got to be on stage in four minutes and remember my lines and somebody wants to tell me how much they love esports and, you know, how they're, you know, want to intern or, you know, something like that. So, you know, be respectful become the super fan where it's appropriate, which I say is online, mm. engaging with all their posts, going to their events, um, and you know, just making yourself available. I always say, put yourself in a position for good things to happen. So mm. yeah, that, that, that would be my best advice is, um, if, you're, if you're talking like the, the, um, the back end side, I, I get a lot of questions about being a, a pro player as well. Mm. That's is hard, it's this pretty much the same route. Think of it as like trying to go to the NBA, where you have to train a lot don't quit your job to you know pursue streaming full time those kind of things um it, it kills me when kids say that you almost have to adopt the the understanding that you're going to have two jobs yes. if you're working at uh, you know mcdonald's i think nate shot worked at mcdonald's um you know prior to him blowing up 
um, in esports, but you almost have to look at it like you're going to have two jobs. When you hang up, um, you know, the apron or whatever for the job you don't love, you go home and you start your second job, which is building your brand, you know, building your social media, working on your video editing, whatever it may be, or, you know, gaming if you want to be a pro gamer, those kind of things. That's, you know, that's going to be the ticket. That's going to be, that's going to get you so much further, you know, than just wishing, dreaming, hoping, and, you know, waiting for that day where somebody just calls your number. Yeah, the other thing I'll add to that that's very well put is even if you made it as a pro, it's a young man's game. Oh, for sure. Right? So we see this in traditional sports. You know, late 20s, early 30s, you're done. You're out of the league. I'd be out of the league if I was in the NFL. Right. And so if you think about that, like you will still need another career. Yep. So, yeah, pursue those dreams. If you are just, you know, great competitively definitely go after it but look at about what's around that Mm -hmm. and i always love this example it's it's the levi's business model so do you know who made the most money in the gold rush in the 1840s oh man who got the richest there's one guy who got levi's i would imagine it's the dudes who was making those overalls that you see in all the old pictures levi strauss yeah that was him so everybody went to san francisco in that whole area in the gold rush Mm mm-hmm in 1849 that's why the 49ers are called the 49ers and homeboy didn't go digging for gold he started making pants out of canvas because they held up more than the types of pants they were in at the time sell the picks and shovels don't go (laughs) digging for gold right people will go digging for gold and it's a gamble most people won't find it Mm -hmm. whether that's being a pro player whether that's being a streamer whatever how can you support those people and make a, career, a lifelong career out of it. Exactly. To kind of circle that back to esports, it's it's not just playing the game to try to be really good and be a pro player. Learn about lighting. Learn about video editing. Learn about design. Learn about social media. Learn about, you know, esports orgs need accountants. Like, there's so many different fields. I anybody, Any young person, I would highly encourage you to try a bunch of different things. Yeah. And then, you know, see what sticks. See what you really want to do because it might not be, you know, what what you think it is. So... The last aspect I'll add to that before we wrap up here is volunteering, which I think business is all about relationships. Yep. People hire who they know. They hire their friends. Correct. And the best way to get your foot in the door is to volunteer. A couple things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to get some hands-on job experience, especially if you're young. Mm -hmm. You might discover something you didn't even know existed, like social media manager. I could play on social media all day. Yep. <laughs> that is a role that exists. That is a role. It's a little more complicated than that. But also you're going to build relationships yep. with folks. And so when that role does come up, there's somebody you already know. They know you work hard. They know you show up on time, etc. Is that something that you would encourage people to do as well? 100%. Just being that face that's there and people know and start to learn your name and, and learn that you're reliable more than anything um, people are looking for problem solvers, not just eager faces. So if you can establish yourself as that, as doing the job before you even have the job, game over. That you know that's what companies are looking for. They want you to be able to do the job before you get the job. So if game you can over. prove that, Boom. you know through volunteering, hundred percent. Podcast over. <laughs> so know. let's share with our audience before I let you go. How yeah. can people? get a hold of you in the ways that you would like them to sure sure uh social media handles are at j harrison that's j-a-y hair on your head s-t-o-n um i'm across everything um dms are wide open so i i open myself up for um you know free advice if you want you know just shoot the breeze about esports or not esports it could just be something you know else professionally um i'm always here to help i i love seeing people fulfilled and you know having their dream job so the more people I can have, you know, get to that place, the, the happier I think everybody will be. I love that. Well, thank you, Jay Harrison, for joining me Thanks, today. Man. I love fun. our conversations. I've been looking forward to this one for a long time, and I know the audience got a lot out of this episode. It's a good one. Right on. Right on, brother. Till next time. Take care. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Future Eye Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review.